So I'd like to welcome you back to the afternoon of day two of Project Brain Week to a day focused on uh, connection and to a really exciting session. Multiple things have been happening uh, in Dublin and outside of Dublin and online and in different parts of Trinity. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. The panel's going to talk about that. All I'm going to do is introduce Professor Brian Lawler. Thank you. So my job really here is very simple. I just want to introduce uh, our Provost. And it's a great pleasure to introduce our Provost Linda Doyle, Provost of Trinity. And I think of particular note in terms of connections, and today is a, uh, is a day of connection, is that prior to her appointment as a Provost, Linda was Professor of Engineering and the Arts. And, where, and this is where she combined creative arts practices with engineering for many, many years. So I think that's a wonderful connection into this session. And I think she's, is, I think, a wonderful person to chair this session for that reason. So welcome, uh, Linda. Thank, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's just my job really to introduce the wonderful panel, but just before doing that, um, I just wanted to say a small few things. Um, I, I think Creative Brain Week is just amazing. And um, any time I've had, you know, when I see, when it comes out and you see everything that's on, one of the things I hugely envy is the fact I have to do my normal day-to-day -day job and I can't just down tools and be here for the whole week. But I have never uh, been at a session organized by Brian Lawler and Dominic and Ian that I haven't come away with my mind exploding and thinking, oh my God, what, what incredible ideas. So I very much look forward to that uh, for the afternoon as well. So I think this is going to be a really exciting session. Um, we have a number of wonderful speakers um, and I'm just going to introduce each of those. Um, so uh, I'll tell you who they are and then they're going to come up and turn and you're going to hear from them. So. Uh, we have Niels Fitchett from the WHO Regional Office for Europe, and he's co-director of the Jamil Arts and Health Lab. Um, so that's really interesting. We have Nisha uh, Sajnani, director of the program in drama therapy and theatre and health uh, in New from New York University and co-founding director of the Jamil Arts and Health Lab. Um, we have Jill Sonka, director of National Impact and Research One Nation, One Project, uh, research Director and Research Professor at the Centre for Arts and Medicine and the University of Florida. Um, we have Yasmani Arboleda, a Colombian-American artist based in New York City. Um, you can see connections are wide and we've already a whole load of people from around the world. You have Rachel Marshall, Communications and Impact Manager at the Social Behavioural Research Group, University College London. We have Michael Tan, Arts Health Practitioner, Creative Health Researcher, Artist and Educator from Singapore. And we have Martina Dovita, a leading postdoctoral researcher in the field of music interventions for stress reduction, currently based at the University of Melbourne. And I think you'll all agree that that's an amazing set of people that we're going to have the pleasure to listen to this afternoon. And to Brian's point about connections, uh, you can already see the connections in terms of that global interconnection, but also um, in really how all of these things are, uh, you know, this kind of deep connection of the arts and health coming out even in, in your titles. Um, just before I hand over to Niels, who's going to kick off, I, I'd also like to thank New York University and actually Deborah Ke Kelleher here from the Royal Irish Academy of Music uh, for helping and make it possible to have this group. Um, the Royal Irish Academy of Music is an associate college of Trinity and we're always very proud that that's the case and Deborah is absolutely fantastic. So it's no surprise that she ha had a role in gathering these wonderful people here. So with that, um, as I said, I have the easy job. I'm just pointing to fantastic people. So Niels, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Linda, for the kind introduction and uh, for the opportunity to talk to you today a little bit about um, this fantastic project that we are um, engaged in. The, uh, can we put that on the screen? Um, the, uh, the Lancet Global Series on the, uh, the arts, um, on the health benefits of the arts. So I'm not going to talk much about uh, um, the, the different papers or, or the, 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 the overarching um, themes and so forth. I'm going to leave that to our distinguished panel members, all of whom are um, going to be talking about different papers. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of, uh, um, of the overarching um, narrative and what this project is about. So as you can see here, um, the, the, uh, the project itself is a series of, of papers that we're going to be publishing 
with the Landsat. It's a Landsat Global Series. It's a kind of established vehicle within the Landsat um, um, publication. Um, and it's a collaboration between the Landsat, um, the Jamil Arts and Health Lab, um, and the WHO. Um, and you probably know about the WHO, you probably know about the Lancet, but you might not know about the Jamil Arts and Health Lab yet, although I'm sure um, it's, uh, it's going to be a big thing in the future. Um, it's a, um, a joint venture between New York University, between WHO, um, and between Culture Runners that was launched um, early last year, and that really seeks to become a global forum for arts and health work in relation to policy, in relation to uh, capacity building, in relation to research, um, and in relation to public engagement uh, as well. So, while, there, while arts and health has gathered a huge amount of momentum over the last uh, decades and uh, a huge amount of attention, a lot of that work and a lot of that attention is still relatively national in focus or, or possibly even local in focus. And the Jamil Arts and Health Lab is, is uh, trying to take that focus up to the global level um, and help focus it also on underserved communities um, in the global majority. So um, a little bit about the, the series itself. Um, the, the global series is, is uh, really tackling this question about the health benefit of, uh, of the arts. And it's, uh, while it's focused on non-communicable diseases, it really asks the question um, that we're going to be interrogating even beyond um, the Lancet series. So this is something that we really want to be focusing on over the coming years. It asks the question, can we consider engaging in the arts as a health behavior? So in the same way that we consider sports or, or physical activity as a health behavior, in the same way that we consider um, healthy eating a, a health behavior, can we consider engaging in the arts as a health behavior? And there's in increasing amounts of population level studies research that is beginning to show, that is telling us that yes, in certain health, health situations, this is something that we can um, robustly show to be the case. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, in Linda's kind introduction, she actually mentioned one person who isn't going to be speaking to you today, but who is in the audience. And it's a cue for me to say, uh, and that's Jill, Jill Sonke. Um, it's a cue for me to say, we have four people on the stage today um, who are going to be talking, five people, sorry, on the stage today who are going to be talking about the different uh, um, parts of the, of, uh, of the series. Um, but we have over a dozen people in the audience who are um, helping us and who are part of the, the, the process, who are co-authors, who are co-deliberators. And then we have over 50 people um, across the world, speaking of connections, who are contributors in various ways as well, who are all going to be co-authors of these various publications. So it really is a deeply connected, very rich um, set of, uh, uh, of thinkers and, and, and practitioners, artists, as well as uh, researchers who are contributing to these publications. And over the last couple of days, we've had the privilege of being at the um, uh, Royal Irish Academy of Music um, in the boardroom, having a couple of uh, um, uh, sessions to talk about the papers and to um, uh, align our perspective and views. And not only has it been incredibly generous um, for us to have that space, but it's also been incredibly beautiful because at the same time while we were thinking and, and highly appropriately, we, were, uh, we had piano music drifting in and out. We had uh, um, other instruments kind of underlining our thinking. It's been a real priv privilege, privilege um, to have that opportunity. So that's probably way too much for me. Um, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to our speakers now and our first speaker who's going to introduce um, paper one. Uh, we, we, somewhat uh, um, uncreatively at this point are kind of referring to them as paper one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, we'll come up with better titles. But for now, Nisha is going to talk about uh, a paper one, which is a kind of framework paper that introduces arts and health to our audience. Nisha, over to you. Paper one. All right. And we've added these photographs in just to give a little bit of a a flavor of the arts practices that each of us come from. You'll just hear a few of them, of course, as we have a few representatives from each of these papers. I come from a theater background myself. This is a photograph from one of the productions that we produced at, at NYU with one of our students who had whose family was affected by um, a, a hurricane in, in Puerto Rico. And she'd created a piece called Maria Se Fue uh, with a, a community within New York um, who had family members who were affected and who themselves were affected. And you can see them here in a moment of rehearsal, in a moment of um, 
joyous uh, interaction, uh, which to me speaks to what is possible here. How do we use the, uh, the arts to cultivate this kind of connection and joy that can sustain us even through the most difficult times? So paper one, which uh, is a framework for understanding the health benefits of the arts, and surely it'll have something poetic before that long title, we just haven't come up with what that is. Maybe it'll come out from our conversations here today. That's my challenge to you. This is the team that's involved with the uh, articulation of paper one, laying out what this framework might be, ultimately leading to that message that Niels has al already uh, offered up the question of can we consider the arts as a health behavior, but we're also asking ourselves this question, what is the value of the arts and artists to society? Right? What practices and evidence justify including the arts in our understanding of health and well-being? What explanatory models exist? How do we understand the therapeutic mechanisms, the mechanisms of action, the therapeutic factors involved in the changes that we see when people engage in arts practices? And what do we ultimately need to fully realize the potential of the arts in clinical and community and public health. That's the end of my story today. <laughs> those are big questions. We're going to tackle them in the conversation. But for right now, I'm going to pass this on uh, to my wonderful colleague, Michael Tan, for paper two. Thank you, Nisha. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and esteemed colleague. Um, it's a privilege to be here. I'm Michael Tan. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, my practice and research aims to promote human flourishing by interrogating and imagining care, right? Um, and I'm interested you know, in this example of the work that I'm sharing with you um, titled Dying Matters. It is an example of my ongoing inquiry on the roles and opportunity creative practices cultural and community assets could bring into the ecology of care. So this is a participatory performance where we make use of lived experience of people experiencing loss and then formulating it into a participatory um, theater whereby you know we will lead the participant through reflective kind of exercise to encourage them to leave traces and encourage people to have conversations around dying issues with their loved ones. So this is an example of like uh, my activation in terms of where the arts could go in terms of creating um, compassionate communities as well as addressing mental health in, in that level. So I'm very privileged to represent a very brilliant group of colleagues on paper two. Um, as well as the larger Landsat um, team working on um, this series. So in, in our paper, like um, we understand that NCD is linked to 74% of death globally. And in our team, um, with our aspirations around arts and health, we are interested to explore art participation as health behavior. So we are looking at a systematic review of evidence for the roles of arts in non-communicable disease prevention and health promotion. So this is the scope. We are looking at prevention, we are looking at health promotion, and we are using the WHO 5x5, five five, which looks at you know, five um, widely cited NCDs known as dementia, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, um, chronic respiratory diseases, plus mental health. And the risk factors that we are looking into would include tobacco use, unhealthy diets, physical inactivities, harmful use of alcohol, and air pollution. And the aim is to really try and synthesize um, evidence that may help broaden the range of health behavior, reducing NCD factors and health promoting strategies in the general non-clinical population. I think that's the focus of our study to include community-based arts and culture interventions and resources. And I think the second aim in, in the team is to really identify structures and systematic enablers and barriers affecting uptakes of the arts in health promotion and prevention of NCD in consideration of the 75, sorry, the 74% that um, we are witnessing in, in public health right now. So the keywords that we are using in our search would include art participation, art activities, health behaviors, non-communicable disease risk factors, and health equity. Um, so this is a big grand questions that we are trying to tackle. Um, what is the evidence of the use of the arts in health promotion and prevention of NCDs in the general non-clinical population? And within that, our sub-questions look at where the arts are being engaged in health promotion and prevention of NCD globally. Um, we are also interested to look into within our search to find enablers and barriers, including structures and systematic um, 
issues, right, um, that will sort of like um, have an impact on the uptake of the arts in health promotion and prevention of NCD globally. And lastly, we are also asking the questions of how strategies of incorporating the arts um, address issues of health equity and health promotions and preventions of NCD. So our search strategy um, actually uses PICOS, which includes population interventions, context outcomes and study type. So we've ran through a search. Um, the initial search came out to be about 10,000. And then after um, duplication, we sort of like managed to bring it down to 6,000. And we are currently going through our full text screening and then moving on to quality appraisal and conflict resolution and then eventually data extraction. So this is sort of like a non-conclusive visualization of um, the, the initial um, full screen, um, what, what we've actually gathered right now. I think the story that it is painting for us is that the use of the arts in community um, is there for prevention of NCDs. And what we are getting from you know, the scope of literature that we're getting at, at, at this moment is that there is distribution globally um, from rural settings to urbanized settings across different geographical contexts. And there is also um, risk factors, which I'm going to sort of like pull out because there's so much. So, I mean, this is the general picture coming back into like um, the where, right? Um, so we have that distribution and we are also getting um, participants from different life causes from, you know, preschools, youth, adults, to immigrants and refugees and even prisoners. And in terms of what are the enablers and barriers, I think there are also, you know, highlights of risk factors such as social economic status, lifestyle, habits, behaviors, um, determinants. And I think what is quite interesting is also, you know, what the data literature is telling us to invite us to think around what history, beliefs, value, perspective, and power actually play when we talk about the distribution of the arts for NCDs in, in terms of equity. Um, and it also raises questions around um, resources in terms of services, partnership, materials, environment and policy, which we would like to kind of like look more closely into um, the, the data that we're getting. We, we are also getting like a good range of um, art participation from dance, drama, gardening, film, poetry, um, singing, and telenovela. So, so I think, you know, look out for our papers. And, you know, currently I think um, one of the papers that we've got also sort of like start to flag out why it is important for us to talk about disparity in terms of not just health, but how it links to um, access to the arts. And I'll just leave you with this. And it gives me pleasure to introduce Dr. Martina, uh, who's part of Paper Tree. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I am uh, Martina de Witte, and I am a researcher at the University of Melbourne. And before I committed to research, I was actually working full-time as a music therapist in clinical practice. And this image is uh, representing the largest clinical trial on the effects of music interventions uh, for people living with dementia. So I found it nice to show you this before I go further with the research. These are all the co-authors of uh, our project. Um, the main uh, scope of this project is to provide the evidence available on the effects of arts-based interventions on health outcomes of people living with NCDs. In this project, we are interested in how, effect, how effective arts-based interventions exactly are, what is known from previous research and which effects are already examined. <clears throat> Therefore, we choose to look at the evidence, what is already available from previous meta-analysis studies because there is really much done already. To explain a bit more about the type of evidence we are looking for, it is important to define arts-based interventions. For the purpose of the current project, we further defined arts-based interventions into two uh, different um, domains of interventions. One of them are the creative arts therapies, um, delivered by trained and educated creative arts therapists. All other arts interventions delivered within a therapeutic context context and with a clear therapeutic intent were also included. Um, these interventions are delivered, for example, by arts practitioners, community health faci facilitators, or other health professionals. Like the previous project, we are also focusing on 
evidence regarding the main NCDs. The main aims of this umbrella review is to synthesize the overall effects of arts-based interventions on the treatment and management of health outcomes of people living with NCDs. Besides that, we also want to identify possible effect moderating factors which may influence um, the overall effects we, we, we will find. These, fact these factors could be related to the study itself, but also to the characteristics of the population, for example, or the outcomes or the intervention. For this umbrella review, we included the reviews with meta-analysis, focused on arts-based interventions offered to NCD populations. We collect all effect sizes regarding to the outcome domains of physical health, psychological health, cognitive function, and quality of life. The initial search counted 6,692 records, and we expect to finally include 175 meta-analysis studies matching our criteria which is leading to a huge amount of data because um, most meta-analysis studies include more effect size, more than one effect size. Analysis will be focused on each type of NCD and will show when, how, and for whom arts-based interventions are most effective, as well as gaps in research. We are shown to show the effectiveness of arts-based interventions in NCD populations in general, as well as effects in specific types of arts-based interventions, such as music or dance or drama, on the specific NCD populations, such as cancer or ment mental health. To give a bit an image of the type of meta-analysis studies we are including, I show you two examples. Oh, and a nice picture in between about the Arts for Blues uh, workshop in Ed's Hill University in the UK. Um, this meta-analysis uh, study is about, includes nine studies um, and is about dance interventions and shows that dance has a positive effect uh, on the cognitive function in patients with Parkinson's disease. The second study is a meta-analysis of 21 studies and is about music therapy for adults with cancer and showed that music therapy leads to positive effects on psychological well-being, quality of life, and reducing distress. And so we have found about 175 comparable meta-analysis studies, of which we extract all relevant data so that we can show the strength of the effects of arts-based interventions. So far, my story, and I pass it to uh, Rachel Marshall. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Marshall. I'm from um, University College London, and I bring you a picture of some glorious sunshine at one of our research intensives, bringing together both artists, practitioners, and researchers. Um, so it's a pleasure to be joining today and I'll be speaking about the fourth paper. So in the papers already described, colleagues were talking about the um, established evidence base around um, the role of arts in health promotion and prevention. And what I'll be moving on to talk about now is the important question of health equity. Um, and what I'll be talking about is how we can ensure that the health benefits of arts are accessible to everybody, no matter who you are um, or where you're living. So a quick note um, up front, um, I'm part of a much wider team, both at UCL and with a, a kind of collaboration of people working internationally. Um, and I've only recently joined, so I'm very much giving credit to um, these folks on the slide. So um, to dive more into the question that we're trying to answer here, um, we're exploring the predictors of arts engagement for health. And essentially what we want to understand is, is there a social gradient when it comes to this in terms of um, who is involved and who is participating? Um, for example, where I'm based in the UK, we know that there is um, sort of limited um, participation in the arts at a population level. And we also know that that's strongly affected um, by both kind of demographic and social, um, socioeconomic um, characteristics as well. And that can actually risk exacerbating some of the health inequalities that we want to be addressing. So by um, identifying some of the key barriers and enablers um, to people's engagement in, art, uh, in arts, we're really looking to show the feasibility of using arts to improve health. And we're hoping that the findings from this paper will be instructive um, from local through to national level in terms of how we can develop both policy, research, and practice um, too. 
So um, what do we actually mean when we are talking about predictors um, for engagement in arts activities? Um, I think it's really helpful to break this down into a few different scales. So um, we can think about this at an individual level. So micro predictors, and this could be things like um, perhaps gender, age, socio socioeconomic status. We can also then think about it at a level up, so at a community level, MISO predictors, things such as whether you're living in an urban or rural area, your neighbourhood satisfaction. And then we can think about it at a country level as well, um, thinking about macro predictors, um, things like GDP, um, social inequalities and, and, and life expectancy. I mean, I think what is ex um, especially exciting in this um, piece of research is we're not just looking at these factors in um, isolation, but we're thinking about how do um, these different um, predictors interplay, uh, what's their relative importance, um, and how do they interact with each other? So in terms of our methods and approach, we'll be analyzing um, data from national population-based data sets and not just uh, one country, but multiple countries. Um, and this is again, exciting because we've got access to data about tens of thousands of people over time. Um, and this will enable us to look at who is engaging in the arts, where and why, and then meta-analyze these findings um, to identify any persistent trends, both um, kind of within and, and cross, across countries to think about those enablers and barriers at different levels. Um, and one of the reasons that we're interested in this is because actually international comparisons about the prevalence of arts engagement as a positive health behavior are quite limited. Um, so whereas with other health behaviors, for example, um, exercise that's been well studied across the international context, um, this is something we know less about how it's di distributed globally. So this project is, is ongoing um, and our team has extracted, prepared data and begun the analysis. So before I finish, I'm, I'm excited to share with you some of um, just a flavor of our findings so far. Um, and this is looking at the topic particularly of receptive arts engagement. So this is things like visiting museums or going to the theater. And these two um, example graphs here talk about um, gender, but also social contact. And by that, I mean the frequency of which people are seeing maybe friends and relatives. Um, and what we're showing here on these graphs, this green diamond um, is identifying um, the overall effect size when we consider the um, inputs from different countries. And so far we found that generally um, Females um, are engaging more across countries. Additionally, we're seeing social contact is an, an important factor. And perhaps it could be that people are choosing to kind of meet in these cultural um, and artistic spaces um, to connect with people, theme of today. Um, and we're looking forward to being able to dive more into this um, analysis um, and kind of unpick these layers and see how these factors relate to each other as we progress this project. So looking forward to being able to share more with you all um, in due course and really um, helping advance uh, answering this question about how we ensure that these fantastic health benefits are available to everyone and kind of can be experienced equitably across the world. Um, so I will leave it there for now and I will welcome um, Yasmani to the stage. Um, but thank you for your attention. Buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yasmani Arboleda. I have the great privilege of being uh, the Senior Artistic Advisor for the Community Arts Network, which is a global network of people and groups focusing on how the arts can transform our societies uh, towards, the well, towards our collective well-being. I'm also the inaugural People's Artist for the City of New York, uh, working with the Civic Engagement Commission and the Department of Culture to think about how democracy can be more like honey, sticky, sweet, slow, right, embodied. Um, and a huge part of, as you've been hearing my colleagues and everybody who's working on this project speak to it, how do we actually socialize and invite the whole of everybody who's out there to engage with these stories uh, meaningfully? Um, here's an image of uh, a well-being concert at Carnegie Hall, the idea that as people go to live music, they're actually healing uh, as they're listening to those instruments being played. Um, this is a, the group of curators who I am collaborating with, a few of them here in the audience, including Stephen Stapleton. Uh, but really, again, uh, the work is to be collaborative and to engage all kinds of folks in sharing the story of this research so that we can transform behaviors across, across spaces throughout the, the, the world. Um, the rationale, the inclusion of a photo essay enhances these global series 
on the health benefits of the arts by offering an opportunity to visualize how the arts have been used across age groups, geographies, settings to support health promotion and the treatment of, and management of health concerns. Each photograph will be accompanied with a written description that includes the following information, date, location, population, health concern, art, artistic practice, as well as a standard credit to photographer and the affiliated projects and organizations involved. Um, this is one of my favorite images. It comes from a project by Antanas Mokus in, in Bogota, Colombia, where we, trans we took uh, 2,000 traffic police officers and invited them to become mimes. The, the trained mimes lowered the fatality rates of people dying in traffic accidents in Bogota. This project has actually evolved and ha now is being practiced in, in Caracas and other parts of South America. But to me, it's a clear example of the kinds of things that are happening all over the world where folks are taking in the art practices to transform the way we think about what's possible. Here's a project by JR uh, in a, a prison in California, inviting people who were imprisoned to really engage in the arts and transform this rooftop with their own image, but being involved in the process from conception through production transforms the mental well-being of those folks who are in that context. Um, I think it's important to, this is too much information, everybody's been talking about it, it would be redundant. This is a project from Carnegie Hall uh, where mothers um, write lullabies for their children. It's called the Lullaby Project. Again, we're trying to be as expansive as possible in our approach. This particular, particular initiative focuses on postpartum depression. But again, what are the visual, like compelling, dynamic images that are going to get folks to pay attention and care about these stories? Um, I think it's important to name that uh, all of the different types of um, arts that we're engaging with in terms of art and aging populations, art and young, and young populations, art and health climate, art in hospitals and care settings, art in incarcerated populations, as you saw just a moment ago, art in health advocacy, art in staff well-being, art in response to the pandemic, art in social prescribing, arts in conflict, art in health in indigenous communities. Um, here is an image of the People's Palace, a project that focuses on the uh, indigenous folks uh, learning and practicing and studying uh, historic images from caves. Um, so again, thinking through the history of our, our, our art practice as embodied and the history of communities throughout the world, indigenous to the present and, and, and sometimes thinking about the future, um, how do we move through a journey in which we invite and are as expansive and inclusive as possible in the storytelling of this work. Here's an image uh, of Takashi Murakami uh, in a children's hospital in, uh, in Los Angeles. Again, in, from within the walls of hospitals and the beauty in, of creating meaningfully beautiful spaces within a, within a hospital, but beyond uh, to, to really engaging with all kinds of contexts and spaces and the, the power of art to transform people's, um, people's understanding of themselves and their communities and their belonging. This is actually a project called the Hospital for the Soul, which premier, uh, opened at um, the Wellbeing Summit in Bilbao in 2022. It's actually my, my own art project, which I developed in collaboration with communities in the north of Spain, focusing on generational trauma and how the war from the 1930s and so much of the violence that continues to, has continued to occur over the decades, that still be, is informing the, the health and healing of families. And so to think through our connection to nature, our ability to see ourselves in the context of clouds, grass, trees, so important in terms of also the, the, the relationship to our climate transformation. Um, the photographs um, that we're selecting depict individuals or groups interacting within an arts-based activity, including variations of dance, theater, visual art, writing, uh, digital arts, fashion, culinary arts, and or music in a specific setting. Um, the photographs depict art and records with, of the arts and health impact. The photographs uh, is an artistic response to health related issues. Um, as you can see, I mean, the, the photographs kind of speak for themselves. When I think about the images that we're moving through and selecting, I think, gosh, how are the photos in and of themselves giving me breath, giving me a, a way of understanding the world that is inviting, that is compelling, that, you know, that does so much more than the language uh, in, in, in a written format. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to bring Niels back for Q&A. And the rest of the panel, uh, as we're going to take some uh, questions from the audience. Thank you, Yasmani. Thank you, everyone. That was a kind of, it felt like a mile a minute journey that we took you on there. But amazingly, um, everybody kept to time, really tried to compact what they had to say into short space. 
So we do have some time for questions, but before we go there, um, I'm gonna um, practice a little trick that I learned here a year ago to break down the fourth wall. I, there's always a little bit of silence after, uh, after these presentations. And maybe you can just take one minute where you talk to your neighbor about something that you found interesting. All right, so we're gonna just take one minute, you go to your left, go to your right, and maybe join uh, as, as a group of three and you just talk about one thing that you think is interesting. <laughs> Look at that. I think there was. I'm just thinking that, you know, this might be the most when this is coming out. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, say, I'll, I'll share that. Okay. And, you know, this idea of if there are negatives coming out, right. Okay. Uh, ask, them, ask them to include send us images. Okay. Yeah, I can name that also. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to invite you to give us your attention back onto the stage if we can. Oh, you want to continue? <laughs> Uh, well, that, that's a great sign, I think. That's a great sign that there's so much uh, space for thinking. There are so many thoughts that you uh, um, might want to continue those conversations, but obviously you should continue them also after this panel. So in 20 minutes, you can continue those conversations to your heart's desire. But now we do have the opportunity to ask some questions um, of the panel. Um, and maybe there is something in the conversations that you've just had that you might also want to throw to us um, and to try and give a, um, some space to try and answer. Are there any, any hands up? Anybody who wants to be the first person? There we go. We've got a hand right there. Can we bring it? How does this work with a microphone? Ah, wow. Thank you all so much. It was just fabulous to experience what you had to bring to us. But in particular, I would like to ask the last speaker, could you just expand a little bit for me on the hospital of the soul? Yeah, um, I had the opportunity to spend three years working with communities in the north of Spain, doing constellation therapy and other modalities that move people towards healing. And as I was listening to people talk about the challenges that they were facing, there was an, a nurse named Anne from the north of the city who said, I wish there was a way that the rain could cleanse the blood from all of the pain that we've experienced here. And I wish there was a place, and that place was called the Hospital for the Soul. And I wish there was nature there. And from listening to her, I, was, I started thinking and making sketches around what it could be. And it was a kind of temple where we could see ourselves in the context of nature. So literally building a mirrored room around a tree, uh, a magnolia tree that eventually became a place for people to do meditation, exercise, circuses performed there. But what was really critical for me was that being in that space allowed you to see the clouds and the sky and the grass and for you to feel yourself in the context of other people felt so important in terms of connection. And so a huge part of my life practice has been that my art is actually a way of inviting people to do impossible things to get to know each other. And that kind of belonging is a huge part of how we think about the curation of this, of the stories that are included in our imagery. Thank you, Osmani. Oh, is there another question? It's a bit difficult to see. Yes, perfect, over there. Um, so it's again regarding the visual essay, but potentially relevant across. Um, but I was wondering about the inclusion of spiritual art, particularly for indigenous knowledge systems and the uses in ritual and prayer and the rest of it. The hope is to really be as diverse as possible in our imagery. And so one of the things that I want to make sure that I say uh, to all of you is if you have images that you think have to be should be considered as part of this study and as part of this publication, please bring them to me. Um, I will I'm, I'm going to be around and we would love to receive as many images of, from this community as possible to think about how we can be as inclusive in our diversity as we can be. 
But, but I think it's a great question also for the rest of the panel because we have been grappling, as I mentioned before, we were in this kind of workshop, parallel workshop, um, the last couple of days. And we have been grappling with this question of how do we define the arts? Do we define the arts? Is it our role to define the arts? Or if we define the arts, why did we define the arts? So maybe there's some uh, some colleagues who want to speak to that a little bit. Speak to it a bit in that first paper as we open up some of these definitions, the ways in which we're conceiving of the arts, but also how we're conceiving of health. And that conversation did come through just this morning around spiritual health. And, and how is that being articulated here uh, without foreclosing any one practice, or any one possibility, but still staking a claim and saying, yes, we, we do support an integrated One Health vision, right? And, and we do want to bring forward all of these integrated pieces. And how does the, how do these then get illustrated, visualized, represented uh, in the photo essay is also of deep interest. Would anyone else like to speak to the spiritual side? Well, or the, the kind of definitional yes. side uh, um, more broadly as well. I guess uh, to add from our perspective of working with the longitudinal data sets, I think it's a really interesting question and, and kind of puts a challenge to what we are measuring and collecting over decades and, and what we're including in that definition and also with our work looking across um, cultures and between different countries and how we do that comparison like I think it's um, yeah a really valuable um, consideration for that and something we need to then make sure that the cycle between the research we're doing but then also shaping the data that we collect so that we can do further research um, and that continues to develop. And, and I think maybe to also move this away from spirituality and give a, um, uh, an example of, you know, other domains that are also um, uh, gray and, and kind of difficult to disentangle. I mean, we were talking a little bit about, you know, where does uh, a gardening um, end and where does farming begin? Because gardening could be considered a form of art, but then should farming, and it might seem a little prosaic, but I mean, um, as you engage in these conversations, you're including certain types of uh, information and excluding other types of information. And I think where we're landing with uh, with all of this is to um, put up front our, I guess, to some extent, our subjectivity in this uh, um, in this space and be clear about what definitions we're using, um, but also clear that these are not um, necessarily universal definitions. I think there's a flip to that too, and I'll just pass yeah. it back over uh, to you, Linda, in a minute. But we've been thinking about arts and aesthetics as they relate to care practices. And I know James Thompson was with us last year and might be with us this year as well. There you are. Hi, James. Who is flipping that and thinking about the aesthetics of care? And that has shown up, I think, most through the some of the other photographs that you didn't see. But I'm hoping that that also comes through in how we think about these relationships. So we'll have to think about that a bit more. Yeah. No, I think we have uh, Linda up front and then a colleague over there as well. Oh, we've got, sorry, it's difficult to see a little bit. Yeah. I'll, uh... Hi, hello, Liz from Malone. Um, I just want to comment on paper two. I think the dying matters is really relevant and such a necessary research topic. I was wondering about the particular art form that you maybe have in mind in terms of participatory arts. Do you know that yet? And in terms of the culture, the context that the research would take place in. Has that been considered yet? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Yes, I do feel it's a very important piece of work. Um, that comes from my appreciation around theater and performance. And because I think currently in my thinking around arts and health, I'm very interested in resources that are available, such as our voice. And I think when I was collaborating with my colleague in theater for this piece of work, I think what we want to kind of like give value and power back to is people with lived experience who are willing to share that gift of loss. And I see the gift of loss as a power, as, as a gift, like loss, the experience of loss as a gift. And I think in society, I, I'm interested to create that space. And you know, I think that's where the creativity comes in, in terms of passing that creative power back into individuals to allow, to create that space, to allow them to write, to reflect, and then you come together and then you share the story. And I think one thing that's quite powerful about the participatory performance is that you would not know who the actors are. So I think that resonates in parallel um, the idea of the unexpectedness of death. And one thing that really came forth in that work for me is also um, the importance of grief literacy. I mean, we assume that we know how to handle grief, but I think through that participatory kind of performance, um, when people step up, I mean, you could see people ask that question, like, 
am I able to support each other? I think this sort of like points itself back into the notion of compassionate community. And for me, when I do this work around end of life, I think it's connected to um, mental wellness, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I hope Absolutely. that answers the question. I think we had a question there. Is it the lady in the pink jacket? Yeah. Uh, thank you um, for Paper Tree. You talked about um, art-based intervention. I was wondering, what about nature-based art or eco-art? What, where would you bring that in? Because I feel it's also important, and I've seen that in several other papers. And also, you talked about um, art therapists. What about um, regular artists who are not t trained therapists? How do you bring that in as well? Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, this is indeed uh, one of the topics we discussed uh, many hours about. Um, yeah, at some point when you do a systematic review, you have to define um, yeah, your type of interventions where you're looking uh, for. And what is important in our uh, umbrella review is that there is a population, a patient population, and that there is a treatment offered. And this treatment is arts-based intervention. Um, and um, yeah, we distinguish the creative arts therapies uh, um, from other types of arts-based interventions, which can also involve uh, nature-based interventions and can also provide it by artists. This is not always a therapist, but uh, the therapeutic context needs, yeah, needs to be clearly described in the meta-analysis we are including. So it is not that clear about um, um, the... the um, the one who is offering the th therapy or the, the intervention, but it is more about, um, yeah, are there patient populations involved and is there a therapeutic goal underlying on the intervention? So this is more how we looked at it. And then uh, we just include the meta-analysis of what, yeah, what we find. So sometimes you don't really have a choice because sometimes it is not done yet. And I cannot remember that we found a specific meta-analysis on nature, but uh, perhaps uh, in the future it will uh, will be there. Just want to comment on this really important point here, which is that these kinds of reviews will pick up on what has already been studied, therefore what has been funded to be studied, and therefore you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can follow that that rationale down. So of course there are going to be huge gaps, and we hope to be able to notice some of those in our working processes and lift examples up in that framework paper through the photo essay and in the ongoing campaigns and conversations that go alongside this series, because. As, you know this will it'll there are clear limitations mm. I mean I just want to add on to this like in in paper two we, we are actually looking at non-therapy base also include non-therapy based kind of art practices and I think in, in our conversation we are also very very being mindful about high art low art and like you know arts in the everyday culture where people sing right and dance where do they fall in in this context mm. But I think the the point that you make, the, the kind of self-selecting sample point that you make is very important. It is at the end of the day, at least from papers two and th three, it is publications that have been, uh, research that has been published. But I think in the photo essay in particular, we have an opportunity to sneak in um, information, to sneak in uh, examples of things that were perhaps not designed uh, or probably not designed as arts and health interventions, but that nevertheless have a very clear health uh, health benefit. Linda, I think. I, I went to a talk recently and I was really disappointed to hear that um, social prescribing, the, the person who was talking said the evidence is mixed as to how social prescribing is, is uh, you know, getting along or how successful it is. And, you know, intuitively, when I listen to you about the art interventions or when we do social pr prescribing here in Trinity and you can see how students engage in it, you kind of you believe, oh, this has to be something good. So I was just thinking about that as you look right across your um, the work that you're doing. Are you starting from a premise that it is working or where does it kind of intersect with that notion that there's mixed evidence on social prescribing? Can I, can I try to ha have a quick stab at that? 
I think um, we have to recognize that social prescribing is a pretty, and first of all, that that it's yeah that that there are many different ways of uh, um, of using of social social prescribing is one terminology, one concept that was kind of uh, has been popularized in the UK and, and Ireland and, and I guess Anglophone um, countries, and there are other places that use community referral mechanisms or or other concepts uh, for a, a similar um, uh, to achieve a similar gain. At the end of the day, though. It's a mechanism that, you know, I feel like, of course, there's going to be mixed evidence at this point because it's a mechanism that's being imp implemented. It has flaws, that has, uh, has challenges on the, on the health system's mechanics um, level. In the same way, if there had been um, health evidence reviews you know, of um, medical practices as they developed in the 1800s, they probably also would have been mixed um, uh, initially. So I think... There is a question there about, like you know, uh, about time, about development, um, around uh, structures becoming in place um, before we can kind of uh, definitively say, you know, this is there's only mixed evidence, or there's poor evidence, or there's only good evidence available. Does anybody want to? I was actually thinking about some of our other authors in the audience and wondering if Jill Sankey, where's Jill? Jill, if we can get the mic over to you, because you've just completed a study, I believe, or you're in the process of it, looking at um, you know, synthesizing the evidence in a US context around social prescribing. Um, yes, we have just uh, published a mapping review of the outcomes that are most commonly studied um, around social prescribing programs in the 13 countries included in the WHO social prescribing toolkit. Um, we weren't looking so much at outcomes. We were mapping the outcomes that are studied, uh, but we did notice mixed evidence. And one of the other things that we notice is that we don't yet know how to study social prescribing. Right, because we don't fully understand the mechanisms and, and we don't have measures and we also don't have consistency in reporting. So it's not really a synthesizable evidence yet or uh, evidence base yet. Um, so it is true that we just don't know yet. I mean, like arts and health, I think there's a lot of promising practice. There are good things that people are observing. There's a lot of strong anecdotal evidence to be sure. And there also is strong evidence around the financial you know, return on investment, um, and in particular around well-being. There's less clear evidence around health outcomes and stronger evidence around social value and well-being and mental well-being. Thank you. Um, Niels, I saw a hand right here. Yes, I think there was, um, where, where there, can you just put up your hand? So we've got, we also, we're beginning to run out of time. So maybe we can take, a, oh, and there's a hand over there. So maybe we can take a couple of questions at the same time. Is that possible? I know you'll have to. Um, Hi, um, my question is in relation to paper four that's focused on equity and uses the national data sets. The, I think they're longitudinal data sets. Um, my question is, in what way are you accounting for the context of place? And are you constructing new measures that look at structural and kind of like systemic and social issues and how that may impact access to, to the arts? Thank you. Um, yeah, I so I'd say we're in the midst of this at the moment. Um, so what we, the approach that we're taking is really moving through those different scales from the individual community um, and up to the kind of country level. So I think it will be um, both kind of working out to what extent are there, there are inequalities within com communities through to the national and trying to compare and contrast amongst that. So I, I think it's a very pertinent question um, and something that we're looking to dig into at the moment. Um, so I'd be very happy to talk more about it following this. Great, thanks. So we've, uh, um, I think we've got a few questions on this side. And maybe we take all of those questions. So anybody who's got a question on the left side or the right side of the auditorium, um, put up your hand. We'll take those questions and then answer them uh, in, in one go. Hi. Um, this is a bit of an impossible question, but I work at a health science university campus where we're training health professionals. If we can just make one change, either to the curriculum by adding a subject or to the culture, Based on the evidence that you're seeing, what one, if we can only do one, where should we start for educating our health professionals in the area of arts and health? That's a great question. I'm going to keep that to the end. Everybody can have a go at that question. Hi, I'll be 
quick. It's really um, a revisitation of Tanisha's question. Rachel talked about um, the social gradient and what enables and what disables people from, from accessing arts, whether it's museums or theatres. Are the people making those enabling, um, enabling that access? Have they experienced inaccessibility themselves? If it's, if it's not the case that, that, that you have, how do you know how to make things accessible for, for those who can't access because of a social gradient scale that they're at the bottom of? Mm. How are we enabling access? Yeah. So two more questions, and then I think we'll uh, I think we'll have to leave it at that. Hi there. My question is also um, in relation to study four, actually about receptivity, which I think is really interesting. And perhaps this has been covered a little bit by what Nisha's comment mentioned about there being gaps in the research. But I was just wondering when it comes to kind of arts receptivity. Uh, Rachel, I think you mentioned that you were looking at people in their museum visits, and I was just wondering if there was anything in the paper that was exploring like digital art and digital technologies, and when it comes to access, the fact that some people don't obviously have the proximity to the spaces and the movement of digital art and digital and immersive technologies, and if that was included at all, and perhaps it hasn't because of what you've already mentioned, and if so, I was wondering from anyone on the panel, what you think we can do to change that in the future moving forward for studies to be funded in that way. Okay, one last question. I think on the left here we have a, um, just there, yeah. Um, hi, um, my question is about the negative impact of the arts. Mm. Um, so there's, there was a random control trial of um, reminiscence theatre in the UK, which came to the conclusion that it had a negative impact on older people. Um, and, and there are, have, I mean, so my question is twofold is, are you just are you assuming that all arts is wonderful and good or are, are you taking some assumptions are you looking at some arts that have negative impact but also that random control trial damaged the arts practitioners and we could, should also ask questions about methods so which uh, sort of methods are you accepting and which you actually perhaps questioning the methods that are being used to assess some arts projects all right so we have run out of time so i'm gonna i'm gonna draw a line Maybe we take this question first. Yeah, yeah do you want to yes. um, go, uh, Martina? Yeah, um, thanks for this question. Um, yes, um, the meta-analysis umbrella review uh, project three is uh, including all effect sizes, and this means that we also include negative effects. Um, so yes, they will be included, of course. Yes, we show the whole image of the effects. And Nisha, did you, did you want to add something to that? Or um, I just want to address uh, the question about what medicine could do. I think it's time, time in curriculum, not taking arts as a token, but really appreciating what the arts could do, because I do quite a bit of work around arts and medicine with dermatologists and also nursing students. Um, and you could see how that shapes and inform their practice. So I think it's really carving out that time in, in the curricula. Yeah. Thank you. Briefly. Well, I was just going to say, when I think about what, to, if there was one thing I would recommend is for everyone to engage in their own creative practice. And at the beginning of all of these processes of learning medicine and beyond, how are we engaging those folks who are, who are moving through that learning so that they can see in themselves the capacity to paint, to photograph, to engage in their own movement, wherever they might be. Artfulness does move us towards our, our belonging and our embodiment. And I think that that's essential. Thanks. Uh, Rachel, you had a, a couple of questions directed at you. Do you want to have a go at them about uh, yeah. accessibility and, and receptivity? Yeah, thank you for the questions. I'll give a quick answer now, but would love to speak more. Um, I guess to pick up on, um, uh, firstly, the kind of digital um, art question, um, I think that's not something we've uniformly looked at across countries, but I think a really interesting early finding, I spoke in the slides about um, kind of re receptive arts, but we've also looked at active arts participation, and that might be a bit less... Um, a bit more flexible, a bit less tied to a specific theatre or gallery, for example, that you might need to have in your neighbourhood. And we saw actually um, a less of uh, uh, that kind of uh, your urban or rural location was therefore less of a predicting factor, um, which was really interesting. So I think it does vary across art forms and we're looking forward to unpicking that more. Um, I think then also to pick up on the point about um, 
I guess, reflecting on our position as researchers and, and the kind of limitations of our studies and, and how can um, we also convince policymakers to understand the um, inaccessibility or the inequality and inequity. Um, I guess I think that links to an interesting conversation that we are having this week about dissemination and kind of how we want to put out the messages from that's coming from this kind of Lancet research um, and how we can amplify stories um, that is not just coming from the academic world, but through photos and through projects and, and um, provide a platform for other people to kind of be sharing and speaking. So um, we're obviously standing here, but there are many more people involved in practices on the ground. And um, hopefully this can spark further opportunities um, for wider people as well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. The, the German in me is very pleased to say that we are bang on time. We, 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 um, I just wanted to say one last thing. Um, so we've talked a lot about the Landsat series, of course. The Landsat series, we are working on it throughout this year. We're hoping to publish it early 2025 and, and for that conversation to feed in a UN high level um, meeting on NCDs, which is going to take place in 2025. So watch this space. We'll be tweeting. We'll be doing social media in the meantime. We'll be uh, um, doing webinars, we hope, and, and other um, communications things. But for now, I just wanted to say thank you so much for our panel here. Thank you so much for all the authors who are contributing to this. It really can't be understated, the, the amount of people who are, who are helping us. And also thank you so much to all of you for listening and for asking wonderful questions. And we're here to answer any more in case you want to. Thank you so much. So I, I am... Um I, I can't let them go without saying a personal thank you. But also, we have a we have a we have a diktat, we have a recipe in Creative Brain Week, which is no tell without a show, no show without a tell. And so much of this is experienced. So this evening there is a show in the Beckett called The Tightrope Walker, which I encourage you to go along. It's a fiver. What can you get for a fiver? You can get a full show. On Friday uh, in Print and Hinger House Square, is that right? There is a new project beginning. Uh, it's the first session where uh, in the Disability Centre they have realised that they want to make a space, a safe creative space on campus. And so they've called it the Creative Gym and their first session is 12 o'clock on Friday. You're welcome to go to a visit. You're welcome to join any of the other uh, activities that are taking place within the Living Labs. Uh, but also you're more than welcome to continue this conversation. I thank you so much for bringing working development to this stage. <laughs>